This week's episode is brought to you by Bob Gurr, Turning Dreams into Reality, a documentary all about our friend Bob Gurr. I forget the website, so you can just Google it and find it for yourself. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George and I'm Jeff. And this is our this is the home stretch there George. This is the final 10 episodes of the show. We're getting there. God, that's insane. It's crazy to think about, right? Wow. Yeah. I mean, Bob Gurr did turn all of our dreams into reality. So I, he definitely did. So what else can't... can we say? You know, we got wow. a uh, a couple of phone calls. We'd still love a few more voicemails uh, to play on the final episode. So give us a call at four two four seven eight five four six two eight and leave a message on on the goat line. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. And I mean, again, if you're driving, go to our website and the phone number is listed there. You don't have to do it while you're driving because that's dangerous. It's time for Disney History! Sound is important to Disney, and not just any sounds, of course, but specifically in this case, the music. So from the featured films, to the silly symphonies, and to the theme parks themselves, music plays a really big role in the Disney theme parks. Um, And while the big names that come to mind when you think of music are usually uh, Richard and Robert Sherman, many others have actually contributed to Disney's soundscape over the years. So today we look at George Bruns and all that he has done for Disney. During Brun's 18-year career at Disney, he composed and arranged music for animation, live action, television, and the theme parks. You may not recognize the name, but you will certainly recognize his songs. Bruns was born on July 3, 1915 in Sandy, Oregon. As a child, he was considered a prodigy on the piano, and it didn't take him long to master the trombone and the tuba. Also, by the time he was heading into college, uh, he enrolled at Oregon State Agricultural College to study engineering. However, he kept falling back into music. He actually performed with the campus ROTC band and also a local orchestra. And he recalled that he really enjoyed doing that throughout his college career. But eventually he dropped out of college to uh, pursue his career in music full time and he moved to Portland. So in 1946, he was appointed the musical director at radio station uh, KEX in Portland, and he's also the band leader for the Rolls Bowl Room in the Multima Hotel. And from 1947 to 1949, he performed and recorded on trombone with Portland's Castle Jazz Band, led by banjoist Monty Ballou. As his music talent grew, so did his ambition. He soon left Portland to head to Los Angeles in 1949. He performed in jazz bands and nightclubs, including doing studio work with trombonist Turk Murphy's Jazz Band. And it was during this time that he met Ward Kimball, who was at the time a Disney animator. And in 1953, Kimball recommended Bruns to UPA, another animation company, who was working, uh, looking for a jazz tuba performer for their short Little Boy with a Big Horn. So around this same time, Disney was working on Sleeping Beauty. So the score for the film was to be based on the ballet of the same name by the Russian composer, composer uh, Tuskevsky. Um, and Walt wanted the music to elevate the film as much as the artistry of the animation would. So Ward Kimball quickly and strongly suggested Bruns for the job, and based on that, Walt was basically sold on him. So uh, Bruns came in to compose the soundtrack. And for that score, Bruns was actually nominated for the Academy Award for Best Scoring of a Musical Picture in 1959, when the film was finally released. 
Bruns remained at Disney as a musical director and aided the company as it entered the new era of television. Disney's 1954 hit, Davy Crockett, was going well, and they were working to maximize its potential. And while they were editing, they realized they didn't always have enough footage for the full running time. Walt suggested some filler material, sort of like most of Communicore Weekly. Uh, the entire the, show. No, we won't say that. Most of the show, not entire. <laughs> um, okay, the outro is pretty good. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, anyway. So anyways, they uh, they uh, needed an accompanying song, so to speak. And so Bruns wrote The Ballad of Davy Crockett, and it became a huge hit. And that's sort of an understatement. And the show's producer, Bill Walsh, Bill Walsh wasn't happy with it, but Walt loved it and gave it his blessing. And it went on to sell 10 million copies. So Disney's other hit TV show, Zorro, was another huge success, uh, with Bruns creating a theme song that pretty much captured the show's exciting energy. Uh, And then there was the Mickey Mouse Club, Disney's famed variety show that was on from 1955 to 1958, and that had plenty of Bruns pen songs featured on it, including the Friday show theme of the Talent Roundup, which was like a Western theme song. However, uh, scores for the films were still on his plate, and following his success with Sleeping Beauty, he composed a variety of music for different films. He did the patriotic theme for Johnny Tremaine, the light-hearted fair for the absent-minded professor, and its sequel, Son of Flubber. His jazz roots showed in such films as 101 Dalmatians and the Aristocats. He also did The Love Bug and Herbie Rides Again, and the hypnotic score for The Jungle Book. Actually, the overture of that film is actually a repurposing of Brun's earlier work for the Ford's Magic Skyway at the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. In addition to Sleeping Beauty, Bruns was nominated for three more Academy Awards for his work on Babes in Toyland, The Sword in the Stone, and the song Love for Robin Hood. He also wrote for many animated shorts, most notably the Humphrey Hop for In the Bag, starring Humphrey the Bear. And I'm really, really doing my best not to sing that song. I know. Uh, (laughs) So Brun's reach also extended into the theme parks, having written Yo-Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me, which of course remains one of the most iconic parts of the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction. Bruns wrote the music to Exitencio's lyrics, and history was made. The two collaborated again on the Bear Band Serenade, the opening number for the country bear Jamboree. And Bruns also wrote the music for the closing song, Come Again, Come On In. Bruns's, Bruns's music was also part of the Magic Kingdom's past history as well. Although the Adventureland veranda is no longer what it used to be, it does still use Bruns uh, in its background loop. And they actually took tracks from his album Moonlight Time in Old Hawaii, so you can still hear that there. In addition to his Disney work, he still continued to play jazz. He led his Wonderland Jazz Band on two recording sessions uh, and played and recorded occasionally with the Disney uh, house band, the Firehouse Five Plus Two. Like many of the folks who worked for Disney at the time, he had the, uh, he had the opportunity to work directly with Walt. Bruns once said, Walt was, er- was always very good to me personally. He pretty much let me go my own, own way, trusting my own musical sense of what was right. The one thing about him that was really impressed me was his fantastic memory for detail. Many know of Walt's final film, the 24-minute Epcot film, detailing his ambitious plan for the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Bruns and Buddy Baker did the background theme for it. Their score highlighted many recurring musical themes from Disney's work at the 6465 New York World's Fair and the Disneyland TV show. Bruns retired from the Walt Disney Company in 1976 and returned to Oregon to live out his remaining years. He taught part-time at the Lewis and Clark College and continued to play and compose music, including recording at least one locally distributed album of jazz. He sadly passed away in 1983, but he was named a Disney legend in 2001. And we'd love to know, what is your favorite George Bruns song? Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628 and let us know which is your favorite Hummable Bruns. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, works for me. He's a nerd, he's a geek, geek. geek. but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is The Great American Amusement Parks, A Pictorial History 
by Gary Kiriatsi. And I hope I'm saying his name right. I can't really tell. Uh, especially because the book is from 1976. It's a long time ago. But enough said about that. Um, you've been listening to the show. You know that I've been reading and reviewing books about theme parks, mostly Disney, for well over 10 years. And the book that we're going to talk about this week on the show is one, for some reason, that I have completely missed. And I'd wish I'd run across it 10 years ago, if not earlier. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, written in 1976, it's never been updated. So it does have a very specific time period that it looks at. But still, to have one book that looks at the history and the evolution of the parks in America and ends ultimately in the middle of the amusement park revolution of the 1970s is pretty unique in this case. Um, So the book starts off looking at the history of roller coasters and uh, the first amusement parks in Europe. And then we jump overseas and start talking about the amusement parks that started in America, like all the trolley parks, as well as the various theme parks or amusement parks that opened in Coney Island. So Gary, or Kiriatsi, we'll call him Gary, introduces us to all of the key players. A lot of uh, people I've never even heard of before uh, were discussed in the book that may have had smaller inventions or may have owned a smaller park that I had never heard of before. Um, This is really an amazing book for people who have an interest in not only the growth of amusement parks, in America, but the amusement industry overall. Now, there are a lot of images. It does say it's a pictorial history, but the images are all in black and white. Not really a big deal, of course, until you get to the parks about halfway through the 20th century. It's because, hey, we had color film by that point in time. Hey, but, you know, I'm still glad to see a lot of the different photos of the different parks throughout the years. A lot of postcards, a lot of aerial images, which really surprised me to see a lot of aerial images of parks from the, the turn of the 19th century. Um, and, and I've read a lot of complaints about the book online that sort of reads like, the te- like a textbook, but it actually sort of just looks like a textbook. It actually reads very well, and Gary's very engaging with the story and keeps things moving along. And as I mentioned earlier, it's interesting to note that the book ends right before the steel revolution in coasters of the mid-1970s. And sadly, a lot of the parks that are featured in the book didn't quite survive the 70s and usually went bankrupt or something in the 80s. And in the back of the book, there's the 100 best theme parks in the United States and amusement parks. And I have to admit, I hadn't heard of half of them. I would look them up on Wikipedia or Google and they were closed. So obviously, you know, take the some of the book's history with a little, I'm not the history, but what it talks about parks opening with a little grain of salt, but the history is impeccable. And I tried to look it, to see a little bit more about Gary Cariazzi to see what motivated him to write this book. Um, apparently, he was extremely well known in the latter part of the 1970s, basically for the number of coasters he had ridden. And his coaster count at that time was 100. And, you know, I know people that have ridden close to 1,000 at this point in time. But, you know, this was the 70s, not as many coasters, wasn't as big of a craze. But he also produced a couple of documentaries. I think one was called um, Roller Screams with Vincent Price which is wonderful. You can find it on YouTube. But I've also got an interesting quote from a 1984 article that celebrated 100 years of roller coaster history. And I think this is kind of funny. So Mr. Kiriatsi and other buffs have been traveling the roller coaster circuit by private jet over the last few years, starting in Santa Cruz, California, a trip that has taken them through nine states, including Texas, Georgia, and Massachusetts, and to 10 amusement parks. The tour is sponsored by G.D. Searle and Company, makers of the motion sickness drug Dramamine. (laughs) Which I thought that was amazing that Dramamine sponsored... A bunch of people in 1904 to go ride roller coasters. That's amazing. I, that's absolutely amazing. But, you know, I went off a little bit off track, but again, this was a spe- spectacular book. If you really want to know about the evolution, the history of theme parks and amusement parks, who the key players were, the evolution of the rides and the attractions, 
It is utterly fascinating. It is called The Great American Amusement Parks, a pictorial history by Gary Cariazzi. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. This week's window is located in Disneyland Paris, and it reads, Chaz Tain, design company of Glendale. Budget and schedules met, guaranteed. So Chaz Tain is actually the name of one of the buildings at the Walt Disney Imagineering Campus here in Glendale, California. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. Who doesn't love it when Flora and Meriwether argue over the dress color in Sleeping Beauty? You know, the cries of make it pink and make it blue are often quoted by fans of the film, and especially in fireworks shows at uh, the Disney theme parks. But uh, when you're in Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom, if you visit Castle Couture, you'll be able to see this happen in real life. Because behind the cast register in the back room, you can find a dress with uh, stained glass images of Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether on both sides of it. And occasionally, you can actually hear Flora and Meriwether arguing over the color of the dress, and any time they say the color of their choice, the dress in between them switches over to that color. So it's kind of cool to see it happen in front of your eyes. Exactly, and the fact that somebody thought of that little detail. Yes, yes. To put in there. What a, yes. what a small, subtle thing that they made into an actual, you know, exactly. thing for people it's... to look at. <laughs> you know what uh, I mean. Five-legged goat. You, you know what I mean. Hey, I'm just explaining what the, section, what the segment yes, is. Again. Yes. And, you know, we're at that part of the show where we discuss the year of a million or so in limited time cadets. We discuss the weekly prize winner. And we're not going to make it pink. And we're not going to make it blue. No. Nope. We're going to make it iron. Ooh. Huh? Okay. Tell yeah, me okay, more. Okay. Okay. We can do that. So, <laughs> as, as you guys know, for the past almost two years... We've been giving away a prize every week as part of our year of a million or so limited time cadets. And to enter, you just have to send an email to communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name and address. And by the time you hear this, we'll have probably eight chances left. Uh, nine chances Because we'll chances record left. the other one, though. Well, that's true. It'll be released, and then somebody will be able to hear it before we record the next show. Yeah. 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 So we've got nine, nine awesome prizes to give away. And this week's prize is courtesy of Disney Publishing, and it's a copy of Marvel's Iron Man, The Gauntlet, by Eowyn Colfer, who we love. We do. Yes, he wrote the Artemis Fowl series, and he's written some, um, uh, did that great uh, time travel book. The, that the I'm Reluctant on. Assassin. The Reluctant Assassin series, that's yeah. it, yes, yes. There's so uh, so the, the um, Warp, it's called Warp, isn't it? Yeah, Warp, that's yeah. right, Warp. So it's called War, but this is the latest release, uh, all about Iron Man. Looks pretty darn cool, so I know I'm going to like it. And the prize goes out this week to Kate S. in Overland Park, Kansas. Hooray! Yay. Congrats, Kate S. Yes, so we're very excited. So when the book comes to you, Kate, send us a photo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Strike your best Iron Man pose with the book. Ooh, that's a good one. Definitely We'd do like that, that. Kate. We'd like that. We'd like that. So, uh, again, if you'd like to enter the contest, just send an email to communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name and address. So thank you guys so much for watching and, watching and listening. I guess I just said watching and listening. You know what? You haven't said watching in a while, so I think it's okay. Yeah, we can go with that one. To uh, the, the latest episode of Communicor Weekly. <laughs> However you get the show, whether it's on YouTube or iTunes, leave us a comment, leave us a review. We'd love to hear what you think. Exactly. And, and again, email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com for all of your Communicore Weekly needs. And you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. And follow us both on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imaginerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. And give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424 785 Four six two eight, and make sure you visit the Communa store at communicorweekly.com where you can pick up some incredible swag and get your official cadet membership cards and stickers by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, PO Box four three two, Orange California nine two eight five six. And if you'd still like to help support the greatest online show, visit patreoncom slash Weekly. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show.
Lobby. 